Parveen, thanks very much. Welcome to day two of the AXA Superintendent Symposium. Michael Kelly, good to be with all of you in Palm Springs. John A. Powell will join us momentarily, but before we get started, just an opportunity because we're live on the air, if you want to interact with John A. Powell, you can use the hashtag CASoups on social media. We're going to put that up on the screen for you now. Uh, submit all your questions, all your comments for John, and we'll try to make sure that our team behind the scenes is able to get to them uh, at the end of this broadcast. Uh, now, let's welcome in a man who needs no introduction. He's currently the director of the Othering and Belonging Institute at UC Berkeley. John A. Powell joins us. John, thanks so very much for being here. Michael, thanks for having me. Uh, let's jump right in. What have you learned about yourself as an educator over the last two years of this global pandemic? Well, I think one thing is, um, you know, I feel like I'm fairly flexible. You know, we've had to have a fairly a large staff and, as you said, work at UC Berkeley, um, teaching, um, interacting with the students. I also found that I'm, I'm not in love with Zoom. <laughs> I'm, I'm appreciative of uh, the technology, uh, but I do miss the interaction with people which is not completely surprising, but I'm an introvert. So it's it was surprising how how much I miss the students, day to day contact and um, and people generally. Um, so those are some of the things I learned. That's why we like StreamYard better. It's a, it's a little bit more of a personal <laughs> interaction than <laughs> Zoom. Look, I'm not I'm not wanting to be pessimistic this early on a Thursday morning. But this is a pandemic that doesn't look like it's going away anytime soon. So, John, the question is, how do we educate in this new environment? Well, I think um, part of it is, is to accept that it is the environment. I mean, you know, maybe mid-year, maybe next year we'll be in a different state, but almost every scientist is safe and then get ready for the next one. Um, so. Part of the thing that I think we have to adjust to is that, as they say, this is the new normal, it's unfolding. Um, and what the pandemic did, among other things, obviously it took many lives, way too many lives, including some of my friends, uh, but it also exposed the weaknesses of our system, our education system, our health system, uh, housing. Um, we're saying, stay six feet apart. We have people living um, in farmhouses, uh, you know, uh, uh, who couldn't live six feet apart. Uh, so I think it exposed a lot of things. Unfortunately, I don't think we really learned from that. Uh, you know, it's, it's time to be prepared. It's time to sort of uh, really come together. Um, so I think the work, the life is a little, it's kind of precarious. I was talking to a friend and he was saying the first time we felt that in the United States was 9-11. You know, this sort of a shock that we were, vulnerable, if you will, in, in the rest of the world. And we tried very hard to sort of get back to some kind of pre-normal state. Uh, but the pandemic suggests that um, we are in the world, we're part of the world. What happens in uh, India or South Africa or Brazil is going to affect the United States. Um, I don't think we've incorporated that learning. Uh, but I think the pandemic is trying to teach us that. You and I were talking earlier this week about the importance of education and a functioning society. You brought up Thomas Jefferson, who said every citizen deserves a good education. So are we making sure that every citizen is well educated? Are we making sure our students are well educated, John? No, we're not. Uh, not even close, Michael. And, and we've lost the way. I mean, uh, you know, go back to uh, the Greeks and they understood the importance of education. Thomas Jefferson. Uh, you know, complicated person, but also someone who deeply understood that if you're going to have a democracy, you need people who are educated to be citizens. And one of the part of that education from his perspective was the ability to take another person's perspective. Uh, so it wasn't just about me. It's can I listen to someone, even if they're different than me? And in the country right now, it's deeply, deeply polarized. Uh, we've turned education into political football, uh, sort of as a, a particular political agenda. Uh, it will, it will, it'll serve the students. And we already have a problem with the unevenness 
inequities in education. We have some schools who have resources, some don't. Um, uh, some have experienced teachers, uh, some have small classrooms, some have classrooms that are busting at the seams. Uh, some schools are cl clearly just warehousing students. Uh, they're not doing much in the teaching, and some are doing incredible jobs. And we sort of throw this at the, the foot of teachers without resources, without, without support, without sometimes care and understanding and say, this is a huge problem, fix it. Um, so we're not fair, I think, to our teachers and our educators, and it shows up sometimes uh, what happened to our students as well. So no, we're, we're right now headed in the wrong direction, I think, in terms of education. So the follow-up to that is how do we head in the right direction? Well, you know, it's interesting to me, I, like I said, I teach at Berkeley and, and um, you know, I've taught at some of the quote-unquote elite schools like Harvard. And one of the things has always been, you know, the issue of like even SATs, you know, standardized tests and how we use them. Uh, and uh, the um, I'm, I'm associated with people who started those tests uh, 50 years ago, and they will say the tests are being misused. And they were used in, in many ways to screen people out instead of diagnosing the problem. Um, and in the middle of the pandemic, a lot of the schools said, we're going to stop making these tests mandatory. Whereas before they said, can't do it. So it's clear that there was some, continues to be some experimentation. Um, and it has to be something that really is for everyone. It's not just for an individual student. Uh, when I was growing up, we still thought of education as a public good uh, instead of as a private right. And of course, it's both. Um, but we really have to think about educating our entire society. Um, there's a book called Between, The Race Between Technology, I think Technology and Education. And it talks about how the United States became a powerhouse economy at the beginning of the 20th century. And one of the reasons these two economists say this happened is the United States was the first major country to begin to seriously educate women and girls. Uh, it didn't do it right. It didn't do it completely fairly, uh, but it started doing it. Uh, and women represent more than half the population. Today, more than half the population are people of color in the United States and, and for uh, uh, 10 years old and younger. Uh, so our, school, our kids coming into school are the future of America, and it's not just whites, not just blacks, not just it's everybody. Can we really think about how we're educating everybody, both for themselves and for the country and for the world? Um, we're going to grow up in a world very different than the one uh, that you and I grew up in, Michael. And um, there's all this stuff about jobs being replaced by uh, robots and uh, artificial intelligence. And, um, uh, you know, so how do we prepare people to be part of that future, uh, both technically, but even more important, socially? How do we prepare people to live in a world that the diversity is becoming more and more intimate, where we see people every day who maybe look different than us, who maybe uh, worship different than us, who love different than us, uh, and still for that to be okay. That's part of what education is calling for, is calling for something for the whole society and to sort of re-knit our social cohesion. You said something that struck me when we first spoke. You said education in schools has become ground zero and our political fights. Can you expand upon that, John? Sure, and it's, it breaks my heart. I have a granddaughter. You know, it's funny. I have two children, and they're in their forties. And so, you know, I felt like I dodged a bullet. Both graduated and are doing relatively well. Uh, and so I could exhale. Not that I was indifferent to what's happening in schools, but I know I had uh, children directly in school. And now I've got a granddaughter, so it's like it's coming back full circle. Um, but just think about the, the mass wars, think about the vaccine wars, think about uh, what we teach, you know, uh, can you teach uh, that the country enslaved people? Um, can you teach critical, not just critical race theory, critical thinking? Um, and all of these fights, and it's clear that um, some political operatives are saying, let's take over the school board, not because they're necessarily educators, not because they wanna make sure students are well prepared for the future, so they can use education as a whooping board, uh, so they can push their political agenda, uh, which oftentimes is that of fracturing the country even more. Um, 
And so I, you know, it's it's a tough road to hoe. I have nieces and nephews who are teachers and the politics of it um, is just fierce. Uh, I'm here in the Bay Area and um, I have friends who are superintendents of schools and I remember one of them saying, the hardest job is uh, going to board meetings where I'm yelled at uh, for three hours, where people are picking, picking my home and my children. Uh, you know, I don't feel like they're safe. So instead of revering teachers because they are taking care of our most precious resource, uh, we're mad at them. Um, so as the country sort of wobbles, uh, education is really important. Uh, and if we are if we are going to succeed, we have to really rethink education and investment and start using it to actually um, prepare people to be citizens in a diverse world. Can we jump into a little bit about critical race theory? You open to that? Sure. All right. So back in October, California becomes the first state to require ethnic studies as a graduation requirement for all high school students. Uh, that's obviously different from CRT. Good first step for California, though. Good first step for the country. That said, there has been a lot of pushback around critical race theory, including some groups arguing for the ban of words like equity and diversity and social emotional learning. So when you hear all of that, John, what, what goes through your mind? Well, a couple of things, Michael. So first of all, I was at the second meeting at the formation of critical race theory. Uh, so I was there. Um, and I know the people, great people. And critical race theory is not a theory. It's a way of actually approaching understanding. It's primarily, if it's taught at all, taught in law school. It's not taught in K-12. Uh, there may be a few exceptions, but uh, the real operative word about critical race theory is critical. It's how to actually critically learn, how to critically examine. And you can always grab someone who says something extreme and say, aha, look, look at this. Look what they're saying. Um, part of what's happening is that people don't want to uh, really know the complex American history. Um, the country enslaved people. Thomas Jefferson, the great uh, president who wrote the Declaration of Independence, uh, had 200 slaves. That's the reality. Uh, and it's an unfortunate reality, but it's a reality. And if we're going to have a future where everyone counts, everyone, Black people, white people, uh, Latinos, Asians, Native Americans, straight, gay, uh, Christians, Muslims. Uh, if we're going to have a country where we pull together, we have to not only learn about each other, we have to learn about our history. It was up until the 1960s. You couldn't, it was difficult to immigrate to this country if you were Asian. The first immigration laws of the country said it was only available to uh, free whites. So if you're Black, if you're Latino, if you're Asian, you could not become a naturalized citizen. That's our history. And what critical race theory basically says, which is interesting, Michael, because some people think it's teaching racism. Uh, and it's not. It's actually, or I should say, it's thinking about racism differently. It's saying race, racialization and racism is a system. It's not simply individuals. So we're not going around pointing fingers saying, this person is racist, this person is racist. That may or may not be true. What it's really saying is that the way our laws have functioned, the way society has structured, uh, is profoundly racialized. Now, I teach law. I teach, I teach at UC Law School. Um, read Plessy Berkus Ferguson. Read Dred Scott. Uh, read, uh, you know, Loving. Uh, the Supreme Court talked about white supremacy as being part of our history. It is part of our history. Until 1967, there were almost 20 states in the country that prohibited interracial marriage. This was written in law. There's nothing subtle about it. There's no interpretation. They were saying anti-miscegenation. Uh, and the, the loving family uh, had to, were, the husband was put in jail and had to leave the state because he was white and his wife was black. So, um, you know, I think if people were saying, you got some of the facts wrong or you're not inclusive, uh, that would be one thing. But to say not to teach about our history, and it's, it's not black people's history. We're coming up on February, and I always wince a little bit because I say uh, black history is American history. It should be taught not one month out of the year. It should be taught 13 months out of the year. It, it's about who we are. Uh, and not just who black people are, it's who, who the country is, and what we're struggling with now. You can't understand uh, the fight around um, voting without understanding uh, 
the history of uh, subjugated blacks to vote after passing the 15th Amendment. So, uh, and really the right decided to make critical race theory a, 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 an issue to actually instill fear and resentment in white people directed toward people of color. It was deliberately a plot. It wasn't an effort to get to the bottom of it. It wasn't an effort to really understand it. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and it wasn't about their teaching hate. Uh, it was really about how do we scare white people and use that as a political football to advance our position um, in the upcoming elections. And it's working. You are one of the nation's leading voices on structural racism, and you gave a speech almost six years ago talking about a racially diver uh, divided America. So six years later, John, what's your assessment of where we're at? Uh, Michael, sometimes I feel like uh, a Cassandra, who's a Greek myth, who's a, uh, she was given the, the ability to see the future by the gods, uh, but she was also... Um, cursed because no one would believe her. <laughs> and she eventually went crazy. Had no intentions on crazy. Uh, but, That's good. <laughs> you know, um, researchers are like weather people. You know, weather people have interest to sort of see what's happening and to sort of predict it's going to be, it's looking sunny right now, but prepare for rain or the, the ocean is clean right now, but prepare for a tsunami. Um, and so we see these trends that are happening. And the, the, uh, Resentment and polarization that's happening in the country uh, is really tearing us. And the, by some accounts, social anthropologists and biological anthropologists will say the oldest emotions in humans are, is fear. And so if you're playing on people's fear, you're playing to a big audience, you're playing to something that's deeply embedded in us. Uh, and we haven't really learned uh, to, how to actually connect that's something teaching should do. That's something that bringing people together uh, can do. I mean, if you look at where we actually had relative success in bringing people of different races, ethnicities, religion together, it's actually been the military. Um, and a lot of people don't like me to say that because, you know, say, well, we don't want to glorify the military. It has its problems like every institution, but it has really worked at bringing people together. And think about this. You take an 18-year-old white kid from rural Georgia, 18-year-old uh, black kid from Chicago, 18-year-old uh, Latino kid from South LA, you put them in um, a place together and give them guns. It sounds like we're going to have uh, a tragic event, but instead you have oftentimes lifelong friendships. Um, so it takes leadership and there are some leaders working uh, uh, I was really pleased after, unfortunately, after George Floyd was murdered, to see the leadership come forward in the country, um, both from government, both, uh, but also from the business community, also from the religious community. So we can do this, although we're headed in the wrong direction. Uh, there's a recent study out, um, Tom Etzel wrote about this in the New York Times, showing the United States is more polarized than almost actually than any other major democracy in the world. Uh, and he worries that we're going to a place where it's going to be very hard to get back. And we're still playing with some people using this strategically to win elections. Um, so I think we have to really step up and, and step up big time where we actually could actually lose uh, not just an election, but lose our country. What role has the pandemic played in your mind in structural racism, John? Well, again, um, the pandemic exposed... You know, it's, it's interesting, Michael, because uh, for a while, people don't talk about so much anymore. People talked about being colorblind, not seeing race. I teach, among other things, the mind science, so I know a little bit how the unconscious works. And I'll say, you know, the conscious may or may not be interested in color or race. The unconscious is obsessed with it. Uh, and the, it's also interesting. Unconscious is not something, something that happens just between our ears. The unconscious is reflecting structures. That's how we teach the unconscious by the unconscious is reading structures and habits. The unconscious is deeply habituated. And so if we see uh, on television and media uh, a person doing certain things, the unconscious actually experiences that as real. So in terms of structures in the pandemic, 
Uh, but the pandemic did was expose these structures. Uh, so, for example, healthcare system, uh, you know, that, that is radically different depending on where you live, depending on who you are, and depending on what your race is. I live in uh, the, the low Berkeley Hills. Uh, we have essentially 100% uh, vaccination uh, in my zip code. It's one of the highest in the country. It's also upper middle class. It's also a majority white. It's also highly educated. Uh, go a few miles away uh, to a place like East Oakland, and it's much lower. And look at what's happened in terms of people dying. It's it's much lower. Um, when I went to get a, uh, a shot, it wasn't a big deal. Um, when I went to get, I go to some places and the lines wrapped around the block. So um, uh, people have access to healthcare in a different way. One of the things they say in the health community is that you can predict how some how long someone will live, not simply by their behavior, but by their zip code. That we are dispensing life opportunity based on where you live. Uh, so we think about being colorblind. We're not. The unconscious sees color. But the larger point is we're structural line. We don't see how structures are distributing life opportunities to people. We just see individuals. And we have to understand what structures are doing. Um, I'll give you one, one example I use often. Um, an escalator. What, what work is it doing? Well, it's taking people from one floor to the next. If you're in a wheelchair, an escalator doesn't work for you. An escalator has biases built into it, not because there's some evil person who hates people in wheelchairs, because almost every structure is doing work but doing it in an uneven way. Um, another example is uh, luggage racks in airplanes. Uh, so there's a certain part of the population that tends to be shorter than the other part of the population and have less upper body strength. Of course, I'm talking about women. So women have less upper body strength and as a group are shorter than men and as a group carry more luggage. And so we have these luggage racks where you literally have to put something up over your head to uh, uh, put it away. That's a structure that's disadvantaging women. And what women do to try to navigate that structure is they make a, a private or personal intervention. They check their luggage, which means 45 minutes earlier, you have to get to the airport and you have to stay 45 minutes late and hopefully your luggage won't get lost. If you just think about that conceptually, that's happening over and over and over and over again in terms of race, in terms of gender. Uh, and it not, it's not necessarily the fault of an individual. These are structures that were put in place, some of them perniciously, some of them not. Uh, the way we fund schools in much of the United States still, we fund schools based on local property taxes. Well, if you live in an area where there's uh, high uh, value for houses, you raise more money. If you live in an area where there's low value for houses, you have less money. But who lives in those areas where there's low, low value for money? what we call underrepresented populations, Blacks, Latinos, and Native Americans. So they're, the money they have, they have fewer needs and fewer resources because of the way we've structured uh, funding education. And there's just thousands of examples like that once we look at it. Let's switch gears a little bit here, John. We are seeing superintendent burnout across the country right now at a rate that is um, quite honestly pretty scary. And, and so in this climate, where superintendents are being asked to do so many things and they are stretched so thin, what is your advice for them as they're navigating these waters? Uh, well, you know, Michael, it's interesting. A few years before the pandemic, I was asked to come, I do work with schools, and I was asked to come in and help with students who were experiencing post-traumatic stress and trauma. And I was halfway through uh, the work, I was, it was for 18 months or something, I was probably nine months in. And the teachers came to me and they said, this is great. You know, we're, we love that you're doing this for the students. But what about us? We are experiencing burnout and trauma as well. And no one's paying attention to us. And you can even take that one step further and say, the administrators, including superintendents, are also experiencing stress and trauma. And we don't have a, for the most part, we don't have a deliberate way of engaging that. First of all, we sometimes there's almost shame uh, and uh, even if we acknowledge it, for example, people oftentimes promote self-care. I'm one who's skeptical of self-care. 
I believe we have to care for each other. Uh, yes, we have some agency and responsibility, and we should certainly exercise that. Uh, but um, that old African saying, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village for any of us to really be healthy. Uh, and that's one of the things, again, that we shows is that the isolation itself, there was one period where more people in Japan had died from isolation than died from the COVID. Um, and, you know, being a superintendent, I've never been one, but I have been head of organizations I found now, can be isolating. That in and of itself, you can't necessarily talk to your staff in the same way. Uh, you know, people see you as, quote, unquote, the head or the boss, and you have that responsibility. Uh, but you're also somewhat isolated. Uh, and as I say, that's where the buck stops. And so everything that's not going well uh, is put at the foot of the superintendent. And so I think we really have to actually figure out, uh, not just in terms of isolation, how to help superintendents collectively. How do we get behind them? Uh, other superintendents, uh, parents, uh, instead, they become the, the, the epicenter of these political fights. Um, and you know everything that's happening bad in our society sort of gets focused on one or two places like our schools. Um, and without adequate resources, without adequate understanding, um, we just go after them. And you know, fortunately, unfortunately, many of them have other options. And so it's not surprising that they say, you know, enough of this. Um, and lose as superintendents and then as our principals and teachers. Um, Michael, I've been on a number of calls. I sometimes start off my call by saying, how do we get in this hand basket? Did anyone notice it says destination hell? Uh, so I feel like that's how we treat our superintendents. They're, they're like you know, in a hand basket going to hell. Uh, I, I have family around the world, including in parts of Asia, uh, uh, Taiwan, and I can tell you in many different parts of the world, the way they think about teachers and administrators is so different. They're, they're revered, they're loved, uh, and this in our society is just the opposite. You talk about isolation and it makes me think of just how critical conferences like this are right where you're able to break out of the isolation you're able to network you're able to see colleagues who you haven't seen in a very long time also makes me think of of you know obviously uh axa right axa's work becomes all the more important to fix the burnout and and to help superintendents um find ways out of that isolation which is much easier said than done john but um obviously something that needs to be addressed y you talk about just the reverence that is shown to other educators around the world. How do we get there uh, in America's education system where we see that same level of respect? Well, you know, it was interesting. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, there are all these videos out there, and, uh, and including parents being extremely appreciative of teachers. It's like, uh, okay, you're with my kid six, seven hours a day. Now it fall, it's falling on me. There's one of them where a, a parent is saying, you said my kid was wonderful and well-behaved. You lied. <laughs> you know, this is hard work. <laughs> you know, I want to go back. I want to go back to the office and not be here. Uh, and so there was that moment when people appreciated just how much teachers were doing. Uh, the parents taking the burden off the parents, not just teaching students, you know, how to read and history and, but teaching them social skills uh, and, and investing in them. Um, and so uh, it was that window where people put that as appreciation. I think we have to be much more deliberate with that. Uh, you know, and I think frankly, part of it is how we pay teachers. Uh, we have to pay them a decent salary uh, so they don't have to worry. My sister recently retired. She was a special ed teacher. Uh, she didn't have much money. She was in Detroit. Uh, uh, you know, uh, always struggling financially, even though she was working full time and taking some of the money she had and buying supplies because she couldn't get supplies from the school. Uh, so part of it's investing financially, but more than that, uh, it's also, I think, education and, and telling the story. Uh, you know, 
look at a lot of the super rich. I'm, I'm not advocating this, but a lot of the super rich turn around at some point and give money back, use it to their college. Um, I think it should be more than that. But they're saying, I wouldn't be where I am today without educators standing behind me. Almost all of us have someone in our memory when we were a kid, in addition to our parents and family, who believed in us, uh, who helped shape us. Uh, unfortunately, some people don't have that. So I think telling that story, getting it out, um, I would actually maybe involve some students. Um, uh, but I think if we continue to push teachers away, if we continue to push superintendents away, what's going to happen to our children? What's going to happen to our society? Um, so I would really take this seriously, and I would try to depoliticize it. I would try to depolarize it uh, and, and realize that we're educating, again, that education is a public good as well as a private good. And the priest of education are teachers, principals, and superintendents. I think positivity is something that's hard to come by these days. Uh, you know, we're, we're nearly two years into this pandemic. And so um, let Michael, me close with this, John. What, what gives you hope? Uh, well, one thing, I mean, you say we're nearly two years. We're actually more than two years. We're gonna, yeah, that's yeah, true. <laughs> but uh, time, time so, is just, yeah, we're, we're kind of at that point now, it yeah. seems. So I get that question a fair amount. I, I, uh, UC Berkeley just did a thing where they interviewed a number of professors, myself included, about that question, what gives us hope. And I gave probably an a unusual answer, but it's real, is that I don't really organize around hope, but neither do I organize around fear. It's not to say that the, the times I'm not hopeful. It's not to say there are not times that I'm despairing. But, uh, but that's not my major way of organizing. What I do organize around is engagement. Uh, I think engagement is really important to be involved. Uh, and uh, engagement both with work, but equally not more important with people. And uh, there's that old saying, you know, is it the destination that's the most important or the journey? And my response is, it's the company you keep. It's the people who are in your life, the people who matter to you and that you matter to them. Uh, it's the village. Uh, and I have been fortunate of having really, really wonderful family and wonderful friends. Uh, I'm not saying we don't have our issues, but the company that I've been able to keep, I was just talking to a young high school student the other day and about trying to have that, that, that group. So and it's not e always easy. This person has some special needs and they feel like somewhat isolated. Uh, but we only need one or two people. So I feel like if we can really learn to turn toward each other instead of turn on each other, uh, if we can lift up uh, that we have more in common than different, if we lift up the antidote for uh, fear is hope and love, and I know that may sound mushy or whatever, uh, but I think we have to learn to care about each other. Uh, and if we can do that, then I think we're, we're okay. If we can't do that, then our bets are off. John, I could talk to you for hours, uh, and I am I am very disappointed that our time is cut short. Uh, but really, really enjoyed spending some time with you this morning. Thanks so much, very much for for making time for us. Thank you, and thank you for the work that you're doing. And thank all the teachers and educators and superintendents. Uh, you know, you, you you helped me produce two wonderful kids, and now I'm working on my granddaughter. So thank you. John A. Powell, the director of the Othering and Belonging Institute at UC Berkeley. John, thanks very much for the time. Uh, we are going to turn it back over to Parveen Amati, uh, but we will see you for day three. MJ Hagar will be our guest. We'll see you at nine o'clock for that. For everyone here, I'm Michael Kelly. Parveen, back to you.